Hello, I'm Rajesh Merchandani with BBC World News. Our top stories this hour. One of the sides in Afghanistan's disputed presidential election says it's boycotting the process of double-checking all the votes. Ukraine's president says a roadmap will be drawn up to end the fighting after his first direct talks with Vladimir Putin. I can say that the idea of the peace plan was finally supported by all heads of states, without exception. Russia will do everything it can for the peace process, if it starts, and we think the process needs to be started as soon as possible. Palestinians celebrate in Gaza City as a long-term ceasefire is agreed with Israel, but will it hold? And Californians are digging deep for water during their worst drought in a century. Hello there, thanks very much for joining us. So Afghanistan's disputed presidential is on a knife edge after one of the candidates withdrew from a process to double check all the votes. Abdullah Abdullah pulled out after his senior campaign officials dismissed the process as a joke. Both he and Ashraf Ghani claim to have won June's election and the audit is part of a UN brokered deal to decide a winner and bring stability to the country. Let's get the very latest from our correspondent David Loyne who joins us from the Afghan capital Kabul. So David if one side has pulled out uh, what is going on with the audit at the moment? Well, the UN said last night that they would continue it and they would put in more observers to ensure fairness, but that hasn't happened. And I can say now that the whole process has been paralysed. Abdullah Abdullah's campaign workers didn't show up. Uh, UN workers who came uh, to monitor the vote uh, saw tables that weren't uh, uh, manned at all. There were no Ghani uh, 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 campaign workers there at all. And there is now a complete paralysis, no count going on. This is just at the final stage when the invalidation process, exactly deciding which the clean votes were and which the dirty votes were, is supposed to have been going on. And it's that that Abdullah's campaign are complaining about. They say not enough of the fraudulent votes, and they say most fraudulent votes were for Ghani, not enough of them have been thrown out. This feels like a very dangerous moment for Afghanistan. And exactly, yeah. Explain to us why that is, because this process has been going on for a long time and there's no stability in the country. Well, Dr. Abdullah has been statesmanlike in his public pronouncements, but behind him there are thousands of men who are saying that they will take to the streets and possibly occupy government buildings. That's the specific threat that's been made by some of his senior supporters if the uh, vote turns out to be fraudulent. And they, since their campaign organisers are now saying the vote has turned out to be fraudulent, then we can potentially see in the days to come a uh, movement towards some sort of street protests. This is all uh, terrible news for a country where the economy is in free fall. The Taliban have been threatening uh, uh, the Afghan forces with major assaults in, in recent, uh, recent weeks and recent months. And although President Karzai says he is pulling out next week, he says he's going to stand down whatever, whether this process has ended or not, it's hard to see how they can now from this process be a reasonable move towards a president who Afghanistan, all of Afghanistan would accept, won this election next week. And does Abdullah Abdullah have a legitimate complaint or is, this, is it a sign perhaps of you know, the fact that the audit was not going in his favour? Well, if you look at the second round of votes, there were almost two million more votes than in the first round. Now, there was clearly a significant mobilisation for Ashraf Ghani, the candidate who won it. But uh, a lot of observers have looked at this and said, well, uh, where did those votes come from? Normally in the second round of elections worldwide, the turnout tends to be a bit lower. And certainly in the places that I was watching in Helmand province, where I was on election day, men were saying that their women hadn't come out to vote because uh, they didn't feel they had so much of a stake in this second round. So anecdotally and uh, from scientific evidence that all of the, the, the suggestions would be that the turnout would have been a bit lower, but it, it turned out to be far higher. And it's those new voters, particularly women voters in the East, um, that all of the suspicion has been pointed towards by Abdullah Abdullah's uh, uh, campaign workers. But of course, uh, the UN 
and the international observers are saying, well, they were in the process, international observers were watching the process, where were these fraudulent votes? We've audited every single ballot box over the last uh, month or so. This has been the most exhaustive process of its sort seen anywhere in the world, and so there is now this a complete breakdown, really, of trust between the international organizations who are saying this has been fair and Abdullah Abdullah's people saying, no, it is not. Just when we thought it was reaching a resolution, David Loyne there with the latest development in Afghanistan. Thanks very much, David. Let's take you to Ukraine now because President Petro, Petro Poroshenko has promised to work with Russia's President Vladimir Putin on an urgent ceasefire plan to defuse the conflict in the eastern part of his country. Mr Poroshenko said a roadmap will be prepared to end the fighting. Mr Putin described the talks as positive, but it's not yet clear how the rebels will respond to the idea of a ceasefire or how soon it will come into force. Let's talk to our correspondent Oleg Bolderov from BBC Russian. He joins us from Minsk, the Belarusian capital, where he has been watching those talks. And, and so, Oleg, some, you know, some positive pronouncements coming from Mr Poroshenko, but does this represent real progress? No, anyone who is disappointed at the lack of any, any grand statements, any grand ideas, they, they've been warned. There's no breakthroughs uh, here. Uh, the talks went very late into the night. Then the Kiev delegation quickly left the presidential palace. Mr. Poroshenko spoke mainly to the Ukrainian press at the Ukrainian embassy here in Minsk. He said the peace plan he offered back in June is supported by all sides. And then uh, an hour or so after President Putin spoke to uh, the reporters inside the palace saying, well, that once again, he said, Kiev needs to talk to the rebels. It's the internal conflict. And in this is a key indication that Russian position has not changed much. Russia does not accept the charge from Ukraine that it's directly involved in the fighting in eastern Ukraine, helps the rebels with weapons and manpower. Vladimir Putin said, yes, we all want the peace, we will facilitate the peace, but just what exactly is behind those words, this is not clear. Yeah, Mr. Putin seems to be saying yeah, we will, Russia will assist in a dialogue, but it's, it's nothing to do with us, in a way, because they denied any involvement in eastern Ukraine. Is there any movement, do you think, from Mr. Putin? Is there a different calculation from him at all, or the same line he's been taking? Well, the meetings like this have a huge underwater part. We don't see what was going on. Uh, and, and it's very hard to judge the dynamic of it just from the public statements. Outwardly, no progress on two main issues, A, Russia accepting involvement in the Ukrainian conflict, and B, what to do with the border. Effectively, the Ukrainian state does not control a large chunk of the border with Russia, and this is where the constant flow of weapons and soldiers is taking place, has been alleged. Uh, so. When the both sides saying about the roadmap, about the wish to seek progress on this, this is all very well, but we are none the wiser as to when the progress will happen and what particular steps will be taken. Okay, Oleg Bolderov there in Minsk for us. Thanks, Oleg. Let's bring you up to date on some other stories making headlines around the world now. And the first of Brazil's televised presidential debates has taken place just two weeks after the death of one of the leading candidates, Eduardo Campos. Opinion polls show that his replacement, Marina Silva, is narrowing the lead with the incumbent president, Dilma Rousseff. An American journalist who was freed on Sunday after being held but captive by Syrian militants for nearly two years has arrived back in the United States. Peter Theo Curtis said he was moved by all the people who had welcomed him home. He'd been held by the al-Nusra Front, a jihadi group fighting the Syrian government as a rival of the Islamic State. The Nigerian government says it has so far managed to contain the Ebola outbreak which spread to its country last month. The health minister said only one person was still being treated with the disease, following two others being released from hospital. Five people have died from Ebola in Nigeria, which is far fewer than in other countries in West Africa. Now, the long-term ceasefire agreed by Hamas and Israel on Tuesday appears to be holding. The truce has brought an end to seven weeks of fighting that's killed more than 2,000 people, the majority of them Palestinians. After the truce was announced, there were scenes of jubilation in Gaza. Our correspondent Quentin Somerville is there, and he explained how day-to-day -day life is returning to some kind of normality. 
We're seeing, for the first time in a long time, families on the beach. Uh, the fishermen were out at six this morning in numbers I haven't seen in a long time. People are playing in the surf. Fishermen are repairing uh, their nets. It feels like normal life uh, here in Gaza now. What's even more extraordinary is that overnight there weren't any deaths. Uh, I didn't hear any outgoing rockets and I didn't hear any incoming uh, Israeli artillery. But if you go just a few streets back, of course, the scenes of devastation are quite extraordinary. Entire buildings have been brought down in this uh, conflict which lasted 50 days. But the scenes we saw last night were now about uh, 14 hours in since the ceasefire was declared were extraordinary. Thousands of people poured into the streets uh, all across Gaza, celebrating what they described as a victory, but also celebrating the fact that Israel's blockade of Gaza